So thank you everybody for coming uh, to this Zoom talk. I'm sorry we couldn't do something in person, but you know maybe this is uh, still okay. Uh, sorry, just got a couple more people. So uh, this is my first time using like a slide thingy. So um, it's really rudimentary. Um, Basically, the, the idea for this show kind of originated with Kevin coming to the gallery um, and just kind of talking about things that were happening at the Cornelia Arts Building and also my background with the Ravenswood Art Walk and just being interested in, you know, what's, what's the role of artists in society? Uh, who is art for? How do we support artists making art? Um, so that was kind of the general concept behind this. Yeah. And Emily, do you want to mention some of your fun facts related to Cornelia? What were they? <laughs> well, that um, back in the day you were running Ravenswood Art Walk. Um, um, and I think that's probably how I originally met you. And, um, and then uh, you ended up getting a studio space at Cornelia. Um, I don't remember true. what year that was. Um, yeah. <clears throat> And well, then, you guys kind of, you got the backlash of all my experience with all that uh, useful energy I had as part of the Ravenswood <laughs> Art Walk. So I kind of dragged everybody into like doing, I mean, you had you had done open studios and things before, but it sort of lapsed over time, right? Right, right. And then at that point in time, we were uh, participating in the Ravenswood Art Walk when it was more expanded um, as far south down to Cornelia. Um, but yeah, and then uh, also Emily created the first uh, website for Cornelia and our branding and was probably the one that came up with that where art works tagline. So it's kind of fun that this has come full circle. So just wanted, I didn't know if anybody, everybody knew that. So that's like an interesting um, connection. So and I appreciate Maybe. Emily giving, uh, you know, uh, us artists at Cornelia some uh, visibility here uh, with the show. Um, this, yeah, it's really important that uh, we keep our artistic communities together. Well, I think um, it's been really exciting to I, for me to like see the work together. I'm familiar with you as individual artists and I'm sure you know you are aware of what your fellow uh, artists are working on, but to see your work together kind of uh, invigorates it in a different way and to see it in a gallery space versus a studio, I think is an interesting experience. Um, so Absolutely. People are still kind of pinging in here. Okay, so um, let's see. So again, getting back to the point of the show, the show is, is intended to highlight the role of artists within their communities and neighborhoods. Um, rather than thinking of the artist as working in isolation and separate from social concerns, we're, um, sorry, providing for the material needs of artists, in this case, affordable studio space and professional community, which generates a sense of shared history. And so one of the things that I'd be interested to hear the artist comment on is how does, um, how do you feel about your, Sorry, I'm going to change my headset. I'm getting some feedback here. Okay. Sorry about that. Can you still hear me now? Yep. All right. So I'm interested in and in what the artists think about that, you know, um, the community of studios and and fellow artists working how do, how has that influenced your work and um and your also your experience um with the community coming into your spaces so this this is the show if um you haven't had a chance to come see it yet there's a few um, installation shots here. 
I'll jump in uh, really quick, Emily, um, because uh, I would say being at Cornelia um, has been huge for my um, artistic development and, and just really making connections within the arts uh, community. I originally started showing in the hallways during Ravenswood Art Walk uh, due to my connection with Lang and Friends of the Arts, which is an organization that he runs out of Cornelia. Um, and he would put up shows around town uh, for emerging artists to, to help them sort of kickstart uh, exhibiting uh, throughout the city. And <clears throat> one of those opportunities was showing during Ravenswood Art Walk, which then led me to um, getting a studio space in Cornelia. Um, and I was at a point in time where I had home studio space that it was just getting too cramped and tight and needed to um, get out of the uh, shared office slash studio. So I um, ended up um, getting a shared studio space with Eric, uh, whose painting you can see right here on the screen. And it's been great. It's awesome to have our open studios, talk to the public, get feedback. Um, but then most importantly, I think it's been um, that, uh, those conversations with other artists in the building and, um, you know, being there, um, you know, when other people are, are working too and the doors open, you know, looking at each other's work, getting feedback, um, getting inspiration from other people, um, collaborating with others. I, I've done collaborative painting projects with people too. So, um, for me, that's like what's been really great is that that community of Cornelia. Um, I think the building has a really nice vibe um, as an artist, but then also people comment that on that as um, as visitors to our open studios. That mm -hmm. um, you know, it's a really unique experience. Um, so the Cornelia Arts Building has a quarterly open studio? That... Yes. Um, well, back uh, when we were able to, yes, um, in March and May and October, and then usually like November, maybe early December. Um, and hopefully in 2022, uh, we'll be able to get back to that, uh, uh, to more of our normal uh, days. Um, but yeah, we're, we're actually in the midst of planning um, the open studios for 2022. Uh, so those should be coming up in March and in May. Great. So uh, uh, speaking of studios, I hear a couple of you submitted some images of your studios to me. I think I think you might have cleaned some of them up a little bit from how they He's like a open studio ready to me. So actually, here's Eric and Kevin's studio. You guys share a space. And uh, this is a, another shared studio with um, Nelson Armar and uh, Kathy Weaver. And I'm kind of going alphabetically here. so. Maybe we can um, talk to each artist about their work in the show. Um, so we're starting with Nelson. And so Nelson had done some work, um, the series titled Walking Through COVID. Nelson, would you like to um, talk about this work? Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you, Emily. And I want to thank uh, Kevin and Emily for putting together this show. It's uh, really a great opportunity to show work. Um, you know, when the uh, pandemic struck uh, in March of 2020, we're coming to about two years now, um, had to alter some of our routines, I think we all did. And rather than go swimming at Wells Park pool, uh, many mornings of the week, uh, I started walking uh, in the neighborhood and beginning to notice things that maybe I wouldn't even see because I wouldn't go down the, those blocks. And um, some of the things were very prosaic and some of the things were very mysterious, like this car and this figure. Sorry, I lost control of my slideshow. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry so, about that. Um, 
you know, in both cases, I, I think the images kind of capture a sense of um, the unknown and the foreboding, you know, of, uh, of COVID. And yet they were kind of just street scenes, but the street felt very different. So that's where the, the work came from, Emily. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember the very early days, even through that whole first year, um, just that it's like living in a different city, like a ghost city. Very strange. I think you're working. Really the sense like it, at first, no one was out. And you felt like maybe you were in a sci-fi movie uh -huh. where everybody had disappeared or had been taken somewhere. Because literally in those first few months, when I was walking early in the day, there were no cars out. There were no people out. It was like everything was a band. Right. Okay. Sorry. Um, do, is Doug Birkenhauer here by any chance? I don't, I don't think I saw him come in. Doug said he couldn't make it tonight. Uh, okay. So Doug is another artist at Cornelia Arts Building. He's not here this evening, but um, this is the piece that he submitted. So this is actually a collage of um, silver, black and white silver prints and dark room tools and some of his other work. Um, Sarah? Yeah. So this is a picture of your studio. Yeah, um, my studio is, well, it was the tiniest studio in Cornelia Arts Building, so getting a full shot was really hard to do. Um, but this, I sent this over just because it really encapsulated the work that I did from this past year. Um, I really, I wouldn't have had a place actually to like work and focus if it hadn't been for Kevin inviting me in in 2015. And now I've been here for almost seven years, which is crazy to think about how much time has gone by. Um, but I mostly do work that is focused around place and ideas about memory. Um, the past year, though, was all work that I had gathered from firsthand experience in 2020 um, in Rocky Mountain National Park during the Cameron Peak Fire. And it really just changed the entire landscape. And it's a very, very familiar landscape to me. I've spent my entire life going there at different times, different seasons. And this was very otherworldly from the wildfires that were going on at the time. Mm -hmm. um, so any kind of place that I can kind of tap into and kind of is a little disorienting, maybe because of its sense of familiarity being real or, you know, supposed recall, I usually kind of inspire or inspires me in my process. Um, and a lot of these things were like just collected images and sketches and nothing super important. Um, but I usually like to go back um, to that time and try to like pull apart like what might have stood out to me. Mm -hmm. And it could have to do with formal elements of creating a painting. But um, during this body of work, what I was mostly looking at was um, European symbolist artists and Claire Sherman and Agnes Pelton in the Transcendental Painting Group. Um, and so that was kind of in the background while I was going back and kind of developing this, this whole body of work. That's kind of a broad range of inspirations there. Yeah, yeah. And it started really with the, the um, pastel drawings that are in the upper left hand corner. Mm -hmm. And then everything just kind of grew and kind of smiled and ch changed a little bit from there. So so you're do you do initial drawings on site or I'll do sketches on site and I'll make notes like about mixing color or what I imagine making that color might be or I'll use like maybe descriptive language to kind of help put my mind back in a place mm -hmm. um to help me remember or touch base with it again and I also took a lot of videos and things like that <laughs> Um, but it's, it's really like, if you were to look, it would be like a, a file, like with 300 photographs and they're all a little bit similar and a little bit different. And then I, and then I, 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 I,
Um, Please mute your phone. If this is you. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. I, okay. Like the circular feedback going. I, I just <laughs> muted them. Thanks, Kevin. Um, yeah, this painting in particular, um, Sarah, kind of stood out to me. I, I really enjoy this really kind of fun science. I mean, it's not fun really, but it's a kind of, it's a sci-fi looking sun here. It's like a molten, molten ball of hot fire. Yeah. Yeah. When we were there, all we could say was like, this is like Mars. It was so otherworldly mm -hmm. and it was still August of 2020. So, you know, it, it was crazy as empty as all these paintings are, there were tons of people everywhere. So like just the sight of it and then just the chaos that was kind of surrounding, I kind of pulled that out of the images, mm -hmm. um, but I think it really had this very like strange, like ominous, but really beautiful and really kind of like, this is cool. Like this is unique. Like, but then at the same time, it was like, oh, you can see the smoke. You can smell the smoke. Everyone was being affected by it. You know, um, it really was bad, but but that was also really beautiful. So it was, I would say like pretty sublime in a sense in terms mm -hmm. of like the timing and so. And you shared one more piece with me that it, this is not in the show, but uh, this is, what is the size on this, this one? 30 something by 30, it's 36 in length. Mm -hmm. um, and so this one is called The Approach. And basically when you drive up 12,000 feet, you're starting at the base and you're driving up 12,000 feet. It's like the higher and higher you climb, you know, the more you get past um, that tree line, um, all of a sudden things were just kind of revealing themselves. You know, could see the color of the sky, but you really weren't seeing that like deep, that depth and that distance and the haze that was kind of coming over everything. Um, and then that you'd have a, a clearer view of these like columns and pillars of smoke that were coming up and then the sky just looked orange so it was really like in driving up at this point and I know it very again it's a very familiar location like right when you come up to this certain point and you're rounding out the bend and then you get this view um but this time it was like you're coming upon it and it just had such a very striking um sky uh, and it was just so different um and exciting and you mm -hmm. know otherworldly I think it's interesting that you mentioned you described them as empty um, also in relation to Nelson's work. I mean, I'm sure this was just kind of um, a new sort of experience of life on this planet, like yeah. being sort of isolated alone or aware of space in a different way. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so next I have... Catherine Drake Chiel, but I'm I'm not sure if she's here either. So Catherine's work is um it's it's sort of a medium size, about 16 by 20. This is acrylic on canvas, although it doesn't look like a, your standard acrylic. It um, you know, these are kind of dense layers. One other piece by her. So it feels a little bit like an oil painting to me. This is uh, Doug Froman's studio. Doug, are you are you with us this evening? Nope. I got some. Other long-term uh, Cornelia artists, like mm -hmm. many of the folks uh, in the show, have been here many years. Uh, this is the piece by Doug that is in the show. It's a uh, twelve by twelve oil on oil and oil pastel on panel, and another work of his that is a collage piece. Um, let's see. Thirty. Madeline Shea. I feel like uh, this is like 
I'm asking for Ferris Bueller or something. <laughs> Madeline, are you? I do not see her on. I'm looking through. Madeline uh, is here. Her name is here. Yeah, I, I see her name there. Madeline, if you're, I'm if you'd like to talk about your work a little bit. I'm oh. here. Hey, thanks for being here, Madeline. Oh. So this is a picture of your studio. Is this a, this is a current series of work that you're working on? This is my most recent um, work. It's, um, can anybody see me? Um, there's no video for you okay. that I can see. Share screen. Um. <laughs> it's okay. You don't have to, you don't have to have video. Well, I, I just, you, you I have just it now. figured out how to get in okay. here. Uh, I, I see you now. Okay. Um, this is my most recent work. I really have enjoyed doing portrait work. Um, it's, it, it's really a lot different than the pieces in the, the gallery, but um, I really enjoy doing these. I love doing the human form and I'm really challenged by portraiture. Um, I have sent an individual portrait in of Jason. Did you see that one? I do have that, yep. So this is a, a godlike portrait really of uh, Jason Messenger, who's also an exhibiting artist in this show. And he uh, is our son. <laughs> <laughs> well, he, these, these portraits that I've really just, these were part of my COVID mm. work. I, I started doing these during COVID for some strange reason. Um, Jason is our son. There's a, there's a piece of his work behind him, enlarged. And he is, um, I mean, he's a person that when you walk in there and his door is always open, he's always kind, he's always friendly, he's always helpful. So he is our son, our solid citizen. Um, the reason I started doing these portraits is I got the idea from tarot cards. Mm -hmm. uh, this particular portrait or tarot card is about the sun. Um, and I kind of did my own idea of the sun um, tarot card. And I used the personality of, of mm -hmm. someone that is really positive. And, and I think that's why I, I chose to do these during the COVID. The COVID time mm -hmm. was so hard for everyone. And I got really into bright color and just, you know, kind of. Um, and the, the figure specifically too during this time? The figure, I just, I love doing the human form. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I really enjoy making it look and feel like the personality of, of the person I'm working on. And mm -hmm. um, so, you know, this is, this is Jason. This is the sun. This is well, bright, it's colorful. It's great that classical. you have this since uh, this Jason isn't with us this evening. So um, this is a good stand in for him. And so good. there he is. <laughs> so you are the work that you're exhibiting in the show are landscapes um, of Chicago. So is this something that you feel you're just you're moving away from or how does your this older work or other work relate to your current work? Well, I, I start everything. I start every canvas that I work on in bubble gum pink. It's just, a, I start, instead of having a white canvas, I put bubble gum pink on there. Mm -hmm. And then it, it sort of gives me something to play with. Um, this is actually a, a piece done from life. This is my view of where I live. Mm -hmm. And if you can see little tiny bits and pieces of pink coming through, very, um, 
very few uh, little areas of pink are left. Uh, but anyway, I start with bubblegum pink and I work with bright colors. Mm -hmm. And um, I was just getting, you can't, you can see very little pink in this as well. Yeah, there's just a little right over here. Little bits and pieces. Um, this is, this is Metropolitan Correctional Center. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a wonderful, I think, abstraction for me. It's, it's a, a piece of the city, but to me, it, it's just colors and shapes and mm -hmm. um, it, has, it has some depth. And, mm -hmm. um, and I just enjoy the abstraction. Yeah, I, I think uh, painting to me is all abstraction, whether it's realistic or not. I mean, when you, you break it down into it's the language of paint, it is abstraction and light color right a right absolutely absolutely e even those figures i mean mm -hmm. it's all just paint on canvas and and this has just been a real fun piece for me because it, it's really it has depth and it has um mm -hmm. light and it, you know it's just this is one of my favorite older pieces mm -hmm. yeah you so, can feel the cool how the temperature drops and that shadow uh, over the L track there. Yeah, it's pretty icy and, mm -hmm. and sort of, but it does have some nice little warm areas. So mm -hmm. it, it's just a, to me, it's more of an abstraction than, than yeah. Uh, yeah. So and oddly uh, echoes what the loop looked like during the first part of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh God. Yeah. It was just was, no cars, no people yeah. empty. Yeah. Um, let's see. So pretty different, pretty different, but there he is. He's with us. Um, let's see. Uh, I, I just made notes of like where people are in this deck. So I apologize. I'm looking. So how about, um, Catherine Trumbull, is it femorite? If I'm right, how would you like to? It's fem right. That's fine. Fem right. Okay. So this is your studio, and this is this is a very tidy looking studio. Is it always in such a pristine? No. <laughs> I didn't think so. I was scrambling to see if I knew I had a few shots. Mm -hmm. um, actually, I think this is from this past fall. I taught a watercolor class in person in the studio. So it was very tidy because uh, there was a group of four that was coming in to take a watercolor class. And so that was the shot that I mm -hmm. found that I could share with you. Um, I started subleasing at Cornelia Arts Building in February of 2020. So just before pandemic broke, I was subleasing from Emily Roinstall, who many of you may know. Um, I did not know her. She had just posted that she had the space and I was in need of a space. So it worked out really, really well for me, but I was kind of um, a little guarded, I guess, subleasing. I didn't move everything in. I just kind of tried to bring the essentials that I needed. And, and, mm -hmm. um, and then a year and a half later, almost two, I'm here and uh, she, I am now actually in the building. I'm taking over her lease, so I'm happy to be here. Um, and did you have a studio space uh, before, prior to this, or were you working from home? No, I did. I've always um, been committed to having space outside my home, um, but um, prior to coming here for about six months, I had had to move my studio quickly and mm -hmm. kind of on so I did move home and um, and learned that that was not conducive. So, uh, and I, you know, as you all know, moving is no joy. Um, so I thought I would take some time before I tried to find my next space just because I didn't want to move within six months. But when she, when I saw that, I just jumped on it. So, and it all, it really did work out. I was very, very, very lucky. So 
So yeah, that's my awesome space. And so this is the piece that is in the show, Guard Life number 37. Mm -hmm. So tell, talk to us a little bit about your process here. Sure. I, um, my background really is in watercolor, painting and drawing, um, but I started really doing a lot of watercolor and then um, shifted over time, as any artist does, just kind of challenging myself in other media. Um, and in the pandemic, actually started coming back to watercolor, which I'll, I can speak to in a minute. But um, prior to moving into Cornelia, um, I, I lost my mom. She passed away. And um, it was pretty significant uh, life event for me. And um, when I was out at the at September, at the end of summer, I was out on the beach, um, most, uh, Hollywood Beach up um, in mm -hmm. Edgewater, near where I live. And the lifeguard stands were turned on their side, kind of like awaiting, you know, truck pickup to be put away by the park district. And I just couldn't, like, couldn't contain the emotion I felt of these symbols that, you know, kind of exude a sense of safety and, and I like architecture and I'm interested in structure and all that good stuff. I painted a long time doing kind of urban landscape, but these, um, these guard stands really spoke to me overturned on the side. And so I really think just to deal through my grief, I just started making the, images of the stand over and over and over again on whatever materials were available to me in my studio. I wasn't mm -hmm. purchasing anything new. This was a canvas that I had purchased for a commission and it didn't pan out. So it was like sitting there blank. Um, it's in acrylic, it's done with a palette knife. It's not really typical for me, but um, I kind of had at it. I was um, working at the time in a small frame shop. So I had access to all sorts of map boards so I did lots of mono printing on the map boards and, you know, um, acrylic on the map boards, just a, a whole myriad of, um, of images uh, over and over again. And not always overturned, sometimes upright and recognizable and sometimes a little bit more abstracted. Um, and yeah, the piece on the left, thank you for sharing those, Emily, um, was sort of a a, another push to just move beyond the guard stand, but I, um, I'm in Michigan right now with family and we come to Michigan a lot and there's been a lot of erosion over here of the lakefront. And so there's lots of decking and stair structures that kind of go to nowhere. Mm -hmm. So they reminded me a bit of the lifeguard structure, I photographed a lot of them and then subsequently did some some artwork with some of these stairs to nowhere, um, as well as this is at Hollywood Beach where this like pier washed up on the shore <laughs> one day. It was really beautiful. Um, I'm gonna share so my family can see. <laughs> Not all of them have seen the work because they haven't been able to come to Chicago to see it. So um, and you, you shared one more with me. And so this is actually a lifeguard stand that you made. Yeah, so I numbered the stands and, and started calling them guard life because I think I was like being protective of um, myself. Mm -hmm. And um, during the pandemic, I would, we would, they, you know, they closed the lakefront. So we, we would walk a lot as everyone did. And we would walk the beach a lot. And uh, there was a call for action from um, Courtney Letterer. I'm trying to remember remember the name of, uh, of the organization that did it, but asking artists to create something that could be visibly seen like in the window or in your front yard um, to create some um, artwork to just give a sense of hope and connectivity across community. And I was out walking on the beach and I knew instantly, I was like, I want to build a lifeguard stand. And I found all of this driftwood. It was as if nature left it for me. I didn't have to cut any of it. It was in May. I was supposed not supposed to be on the beach, but it was the happiest day of the pandemic ever for me because I was outdoors and I was using my hands and making and creating. So mm -hmm. 
it stood on the beach all summer. And um, when they started grooming the beaches, they would groom around it. And then eventually they wanted to move it. And they were so kind, they actually put it in their little front loader and moved it up to the dune grass. Hmm. So it remained in the dune grass for a long time and has subsequently fallen over. And I've sort of just let it deteriorate over time. Mm -hmm. um, but this was number 73 in the series. <laughs> cool. Thank you for sharing that with us, Catherine. You're welcome. Um, We're happy to be in Cornelia, by the way. <laughs> and thanks for having this show, both to Kevin and Emily. Let's see. Um, Tiffany Stronsky, do you feel ready to? <laughs> oh, I've got lots of fun, fun. So you saw some great pictures of your studio here and we can see that you're in your studio right now. Well, this is a lovely virtual picture of my studio, oh, nice. okay. <laughs> uh, which you'll tell if I move too much, but, um, <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, just just to pile on to some of the other uh, Cornelia love, and I won't maybe tell the whole story because I know Eric is here and he's coming up next, but just, just really thinking about the artist community and, um, you know, how we connect in such a big city, but also how we help each other and influence each other. Um, I've always studied art and eons ago when I moved here was taking, I started in pottery actually at Lill Street Gallery when Lill Street was still on a street called Lill Street in um, Lincoln Park area. They're now in Ravenswood for those who know it, but um, that's where I met Eric and we studied with a really great oil painter who um, you know well too, Emily, Ed Hinckley. Um, and he just really encouraged us and, um, really was the person who said like, I mean, honestly, this stuff sounded scary, but he was like, of course you can apply to be in around the coyote at the flat iron building, which all of that I think has kind of changed, but, um, you know, just really so great to have a mentor and someone who not only was, was guiding our work and giving us thought provoking ideas, um, but encouraging us and he didn't have to, I think just to like, give it a chance, whatever that meant for you. Um, and I still remember a day in one of those classes, I was doing figure work, um, way back when, and, and I don't even remember this person's name, but he was a painter in the class and he looked at something I did and was like, oh, I think you're inspired by Alice Neal. And I was like, oh gosh, I need to write that down. Who's Alice Neal? <laughs> and now like I have her picture book and like, you know, so there's so much value in um, being around artists um, and, and talking about work and huge shout out on the phone um, here to Nancy Cherick, who, you know, was such a great influence and friend and, um, you know, art, art. I, I think friendly critique might be the way I would put it, but like someone who I could just walk down the hall with, I think she's moved to Tucson uh, since those days. But, um, you know, so many of you on the phone now, just to, just to have a casual hallway conversation. And then it usually turns into like, what are you working on? And you peek in someone's door and you can ask a question. Um, that's all really fun. So um, these things, uh, oh, and well, I'm not, I'm not gonna go into my Eric story. He may or may not tell it, but me, Eric and Kevin at one point shared a space um, and it was awesome. <laughs> um, I, and now I'm next door to them. So it's still pretty close. Um, a lot of us have talked about the pandemic and um, having a space, you know, right in the beginning and kind of the darkest days, I would say my studio space was literally one of the only places I went outside of my home. Um, I'm lucky enough to have a job that I work remotely uh, most of the time anyways. Um, but I just felt such an outlet there. And I think all of us, you know, 
being being able to express ourselves creatively in any way, any medium um, was was just so freeing in so many ways. So um, two things kind of happened for me. I think um, I did a lot of faster work. Um, the the pieces I have, well, I'll talk about these, but well, yeah, um, the pieces I have in the show now um, are quicker, faster. They're on canvas paper um, versus stretched canvas, which for some reason for me, that just like, I go faster, I'm less precious about it, which I think all of us on the phone who are painters, you reach a point where you're like, oh my gosh, I love it and I don't wanna hurt it, but it's not done. Like there's so much overthinking that I, I personally can do. So having some things where I really go fast um, and just let the oil paint um, be at least half of the story is, is really fun for me. Um, I also started doing a lot more with um, oil pastels. So you see those kind of carved in or on top of oil paint and, and it's added a lot more texture and, and kind of fun um, and really it, like experiments because I don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> um, halfway through, I might think it's terrible and I keep working it and working it. And then I'm like, okay, uh, I, I like it. Um, the other ones you showed, Emily, um, you know, the other thing that kind of hit me during, during COVID, I was this sense of like not wasting a thing. Um, and, and the other pieces, if you, yeah. So the one on the easel here, you, you can't really tell, um, but both of these have cut out pieces of dried oil paint from my palette paper. So I, I always use palette paper. Some people on the phone might use glass or other ways, um, to mix their paints. But I have sheets and sheets and sheets of dried oil paint um, sitting around. And, you know, it's so precious, it's so expensive and really beautiful. And often there's stuff on your palette that you weren't thinking about at all, but there's interesting color combos, et cetera. So, mm -hmm. I think I was inspired by COVID and, you know, when you think for a while, you might not be able to buy enough toilet paper for your home. <laughs> like, you know, I didn't want to waste a thing. So I started cutting out dried oil paint and collaging it in. And then this one on the easel, you can see, I also kind of use some oil pastels and, um, it, I've always been really vibrant colors or something. I just kind of embraced because there's nothing I can do about it. It's how I, how I approach the work, but I feel like this brought, um, another layer of texture, um, mm -hmm. which is really fun for me just to keep experimenting with and see what happens. That's kind of interesting that you mentioned that you started in pottery. I didn't know that. And, uh, looking at your work now with that in mind, it's like almost coming back to that a little bit, you know, working with clay and the feeling and the clay, the texture of it, it's kind of you know, in that dried paint and the oil pastel too. Yeah, it, it might've been a really um, nice way of saying this, but I studied with a, a pottery teacher at Lille for a while and mm -hmm. um, he was a sculptor and an oil painter. And so he was very avant-garde. He once tried to, he had us try to throw a pot on the wheel, but he said, don't use your hands, use tools like a a hammer and a stick. And so I loved that stuff because I didn't, I wasn't one of the um, students who wanted to make six coffee mugs that were identical. <laughs> That's just not my personality. Um, but I think he was polite because after like probably a few rounds of classes, he was like, you know, I don't think you care about the vessel. You care about the colors and the glaze and the slip. And I think oil paint would be great for you. So he kind of passed me on to Ed Hinckley um, who was just such a fabulous mentor. Um, and probably one of the ways I eventually met, um, Mary and Kritschka and, and you, Emily, and you were both amazing influences and, uh, friends and, you know, you've done so much for so many artists, even, um, inspiring us and building our websites and now with your gallery. So thank you. Um, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I appreciate that, Tiffany. 
uh let's we're getting a little tight on time so i'm just gonna move on to kevin who is a co-curator in this show with me oops Wait. that's not me that's not that is not you you're much neater than that kevin oh well, sometimes <laughs> Okay, now I got it. This so this is your studio. Are you in a virtual yep. meta universe I am, now? Or are you? Yep, I am. So we're getting the yeah. The, so this is what it's like looking into a a window <laughs> or a, a mirror right. in an elevator. Where just... but this is also much cleaner than it is when you're working. Yes, right? indeed. So this is a open studio shot. So yeah. um, so really... the you know the cool thing about studios is they are laboratories, right? They kind of, you have permission there to be free to experiment and explore and fail. Like being able to fail is the most important freedom that you can give yourself as an artist, I think. So, absolutely, lots of failure happening in that yep, absolutely. Uh, area. 90% like fails. <laughs> <laughs> and some successes that yeah, you get yeah. to hang on the wall. But, um, but it's the progressive yeah. thing, you know, everything that you work on feeds into the next thing. It's not about like the finished painting product, but the process throughout the course of your life and discovering and creating this work. Absolutely. And like, uh, it's a great point because the way I like to work is to work on multiple pieces at once. Mm -hmm. And so it all kind of informs each other. And it's, if you get stuck on one piece, I can put that away you know off to the side a little bit work on another one and um you know just have multiple pieces going at once uh and, and so then it also creates some cohesion too because whether it's you know usually subject matter for me these days is cityscapes um and so um if i'm working on multiple pieces at once and one thing's not working and i can put it off to the side and work on another one um you know, I'm sharing the color palette. And mm -hmm. so that kind of creates the, the connection between the pieces uh, as well. And uh, this one that you're showing, uh, Fire Escape Vertigo, uh, also a, a early COVID painting. I, I did a series where I, I shot a bunch of photographs down in the loop um, in the early stages uh, when no one was around, um, just looking up in those really tall alleys um, just west of Michigan Avenue. And I created a series um, of paintings on that. And it was just having that feeling of things falling towards you, tumbling down, just kind of out of control and um, a lot of uncertainty going on. And so, um, but also trying to push myself in the way I do my cityscapes because a lot of my work is sort of like kind of straight on. And so this has really um, helped me to kind of just switch that up and work on mm -hmm. sharp angles and interesting vantage points. Um, and just has now created this like new experimental area for me. Um, so I also did a whole, oh, go ahead. Emma. You, you also do photography. Yes. So how does that inform your compositions? Um, uh, very strongly, actually. Um, I started out as a photographer a uh, long time ago and um, probably like early 90s, I was shooting photographs. And then when I moved to the city, I got laid off from a job and, and um, just started exploring the city by taking photographs and got really drawn to the older architecture, the industrial buildings, the rooftop mm -hmm. water tanks, which I've done a lot of uh, paintings based on those, as well as photographs, um, L trains. Um, and so I'll use the photographs as reference. Um, in this particular case, it's, you know, pretty much a direct reference of like looking straight up, but I'll combine different elements sometimes and just have a lot of printouts of photographs on studio wall as I'm sketching. I'll do preliminary charcoal sketches and then transfer that to canvas and then mm -hmm. kind of uh, change things around as I uh, build the painting. And so uh, photography has been very important to me. And, and sometimes I'll even just like have my iPhone holding it while I'm like 
sketching a piece. So I'll just do it from a small little screen into mm -hmm. a, you know, 36 by 48 canvas um, and get the drawing down that way. So. This, and this is another one that's in the show. This is yep. from 2015, I think. Yes. So um, this, yeah, it was interesting to me and why I submitted this one along with the previous image was because this also has it kind of looking up um, vantage point, um, like walking along the L tracks, but it's highly exaggerated, of course, um, and just um, you know, when you're underneath the L in the loop and you look up and the train's going by, you kind of get you know, some really interesting obscured angles um, and the buildings seem to shift and it's just, you know, more about that energy of mm -hmm. the loop and the train going by and, um, and then just taking some creative liberties and, you know, uh, right. not drawing a straight line all the time, so. <laughs> well, I, the urban landscapes that you do and, you know, looking up, it, it sort of makes me think of um, like earlier paintings, uh, like from the Works Progress Administration, where you're kind of, you have this ideal of the worker and industry um, as an American enterprise. So, and I feel like that kind of parallels a little bit, like the work of the artist, like the kind of visionary work of the artist. Yeah, definitely. And with, you know, Chicago is, I still think very unique in that we still have so much of this older mm -hmm. architecture and connection to these older periods of time that's still there. It's, it's disappearing. And that's also why I've documented the rooftop water tanks, which used to be in the thousands that are now probably less than way less than 200 around the city. And so, um, and even, you know, the L train, it's a relic. That thing mm -hmm. is, you know, uh, <laughs> it chugs. And so, um, but it's really cool and unique. And when you walk around um, the, you know, the elevated line downtown around the loop, it's, you know, a, a really cool thing to see and mm -hmm. offers a lot of just unlimited visual um opportunities for, for me personally and maybe like in addition to being cool to see it's kind of like it's uh it's like a fragment of the shared culture that we have that art in my opinion can is able to kind of synthesize and share with more people because when you paint a picture like this you're changing our perspective of this mundane everyday scene you're elevating it because now it's a painting now it's kind of special. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's, it's something that people can recognize, but it's also different. And then my, my color palette choices are also different than you'd normally like, you mm -hmm. know, normally would see brighter color palette. Um, and so, yeah. And it's also, also been influenced because of my day job working downtown, um, you know, all these years where, um, you know, I, I get inspiration by taking walks at lunch, taking photographs and and right. then I can bring that into my work in the studio. So. Cool. Thanks, Kevin. Not to mention Cornelia being right next to the L train mm -hmm. and the, the Metro sandwiched in. And um, so, yeah. Um, and uh, I'd like to share work by um, Kathy Weaver now. Let me, if I can get the number of the slide right. Where's Kathy and Nelson? So this is your shared studio. Right. And uh, when I walked in to look at this, I realized how perfect it was because uh -huh. uh, Nelson's space is upstairs, not a lot of light, but then he's on the computer um, doing his photography. And then I have the downstairs area, which was an old stable and lots of other things that people have uh -huh. <laughs> shared with us uh, about this particular part of Cornelia Arts building. And I have really fond memories of the building too, because I remember going to open studios and, and uh, Nancy was there and um, uh, Sharon was visiting and uh, lots of other people. So it's it's been great because we moved um, and we're pretty close. We can ride our bikes easily to the studio. You can walk, we can take the train, whatever. So it's it's been great. Um, and thanks Emily and Kevin uh, for doing this. So 
um, yeah, I think it's important to work um, outside your home because I'm such a workaholic. It's really good to have a separation for me mm -hmm. personally of, you know, time and space. Um, so in the show are two examples of my series that I started, I think before, did I start these before the COVID? I'm not sure. Know. Yeah. Anyway, I, I've done a number of them. I just worked steadily. We just got up, made our lunches, came to the studio every day. So COVID was um, an ordeal, but we were really lucky to have this place to come to and, you know, create. So um, these are wash on uh, handmade paper. They're 40 by 16 unframed. Uh, and avatars being symbols of um, characteristics of people's personalities. So each one of them, the avatars, I'm trying to get at a certain aspect of our society. Um, of course, the one on the right, um, very dystopian. Uh, she is um, a housewife who um, is being besieged by drones. And of course, it's a statement about anxiety and, and uh, warfare in modern times uh, being done uh, to citizens. Uh, and they may not always be the soldier they're aiming for. Uh, and it's done long distance. It's a totally different kind of warfare than history has known. And I think it's very cruel uh, in that respect. And then the one on the left, uh, on your left, um, is um, uh, I'm calling a stone man or Stein man. Um, and uh, I've used this character uh, innumerable times in a series that I've done using various characters that I've made up and he's one of the characters. And uh, here he is trampling over the toys, the kids are climbing all over him and it's, uh, it's a little bit creepy. Um, and there is the fun aspect of uh, us full Disney world in the background, but of course the kids are uh, breathing through these helmets. So my work, you know, is kind of cheerful and then it has this edge of, uh, stress or yeah the ambiguity is really intriguing in your work and you know the colors and the style are very playful and approachable appealing but the story that you're telling is pretty dark uh yes <laughs> that's right <laughs> I'm, I'm actually a very happy person <laughs> but uh you know there I feel like the role of the artist one of the roles of the artist is to reflect on our times and mm -hmm. uh, I'm feeling uh, pretty, pretty, pretty frightened about what's what's happening. Um, do, you, do you feel like the that voice is heard or has a place of any import? You mean the artist's voice? Yeah. Well, yeah, I think it's very important. I mean, we're besieged by images, and mm -hmm. why shouldn't the artist put out? We're besieged by advertising imagery, uh, you right. know, which is telling the consumer to buy, 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 and um, promoting other sorts of propaganda. So why shouldn't the artist put out, you know? And I think that's been true through time, uh, you know, it's, trying uh, to reflect and to be a witness to what's going on. Mm -hmm. Well, art makes us think. I mean, that's sort of the, the function of it, right? It's, it asks us to contemplate and reflect and think about ourselves and society and, you know, what, our, what we're doing with our lives. Mm -hmm. Whereas advertising, it's the, the opposite intent, right? Mm -hmm. it, they don't want us to think about anything. Right, right, right. Yeah. So you shared another piece with me. And I included uh, another oh, piece thanks. that you sent. Yeah. So there you see Stone Man. Thanks for doing that, Emily. That's clever. Um, so the one on the left is a, a smaller painting. It's probably, it's also gouache though, probably about uh, 16 by 16. And um, it's from a series I probably did about 30 some paintings called Origin Story, where I just 
brought these different characters in conflict with one another. There were three different characters, bullet head that you see there, those little conical shapes and stone man, and then the winged one, which you see on the kind of life, lifeguard stand <laughs> in the rear. Um, so that was a series that then led into these avatars. Um, I really love pattern and design. And I thought this avatar was a pretty hopeful one. It's called Born Beautiful. I'm really impressed by the young people and what's happening in terms of various organizations and, and just things they're doing on the street. Um, mm -hmm. So, but the crow is there, you know, telling us to beware uh, or to, you know, kind of a, uh, a forebearer of, um, you know, not so nice things might be happening. So how to, uh, how do um, existing uh, like folktales and mythologies factor into the mythology that you've created in this story? Well, I think they're really important. Um, I taught public art for 34 years. And so children's art and folk art, because we traveled a lot, folk art was very important. Uh, and I, I, I'm a storyteller. So, you know, I have my own little world and <laughs> I like to go into that and bring out different scenarios. And that's what origin story was about, was just building kind of my own my own world. I mean, we all do that as artists. Mm -hmm. We all are just creating our own worlds, you know, over and over again. So yeah, I think folk tales are pretty important. Young, young is a very big influence in terms of trying to not think, overthink the symbolism, just try to bring it out of mm -hmm. your subconscious. That's what I'm really trying now, not to censor myself at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a lifelong struggle. Yeah. Um, thanks, Kathy. Well, thank you, Emily. Um, Sharon, do yes. you, Hi. thanks for staying with us. Um, let me see if I can get to your slide. So this is your studio. It's my studio, yes. And have you, how long have you been at the Cornelia Arts Building? Um, I have been there for just about five years. And I got to know the building when I met Nancy and started coming to open studios. And through Nancy, I got to know a lot of people there. So when I moved in, um, I already had friends. I already, um, you know, felt community there. Mm -hmm. And wanted to also mention that furniture uh, is shared by all us all. Catherine had a table in there that um, I inherited when I moved in and uh, my studio mate used it. And when my former studio, studio mate moved out, she put it in the hallway and I just saw it in Catherine's photo there. Um, so yeah, about five years, but I've been hanging out there like about I don't know, 10, 12 years. Mm -hmm. So this is one of the pieces that you have on the show. This is called Dancing in the Rain. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, 16 by 16. This Correct. One. Yeah. On pastel board. Mm -hmm. So tell me a little bit about your, these, these paintings are abstract, but there's a, real kind of organic kinetic energy to them too. So what's your process for starting these works? Um, my process for starting the work, and I have to say that this is really a departure from what I had been doing before in, in many ways, not entirely. Um, I start these works by playing a game they're not about games, but I start them by playing a game because uh, I've got to start somewhere. And, and I'll just grab a marker, whether it's a color marker or white marker, and I may start by spacing them an inch in the same color or by um, 
lining one from the top part way down, the next one from the bottom part way up. And I use a, a, an ongoing set of games like that in between all of the other lines until I really have a grasp of uh, what it's going to look like. Mm -hmm. And then I start getting more deliberate about where I'm putting lines. And this is one that doesn't have a lot of variation in the width of the lines. Many of my work does. Um, but they're all really have their foundation in landscape. Mm -hmm. I used to do mostly landscape. And that is what I really think about when I'm working. I, I really think about mostly about the sky and about the colors in the sky and the atmosphere. Um, I'm very process oriented. So I take that cumulative knowledge of uh, the grays or the pinks of flowers and incorporate it in. And, you know, I want to add that, that unlike a lot of artists and, and many who are here, that in time of crisis, I just keep working. I'm one of those. Mm -hmm. I don't necessarily respond to it directly. I'm much more internal. So I may be experiencing it, but it doesn't, it doesn't really come into play in my work. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that, um, yeah, just like the process of working is being present, right? And it, yes. it cultivates an awareness of things around you um, that does inform the work. Even, you know, I think like when I look at your work, I, I see like kind of layers of time and history in these pieces too. It's not, it's not purely aesthetic to me. Like there's kind of a conceptual. Um, well, there definitely is. It, it is not purely aesthetic. It is certainly mm -hmm. my cumulative experience. And um, there are layers of history. The, you know, some of the, I did some very hot pink work. Uh, as I said, I used to do a lot of landscape. We, you know, this piece in particular um, was my, kind of putting my toe back in the water of landscape. This is taken directly from another piece that I did. So my entire history is in it, my history of life. It's just for me, I'm much more internal mm -hmm. and um, I don't necessarily work to a set of circumstances. Mm -hmm. So it may be present in how I feel, but not right. outwardly, purposely put into my work. Right. And you shared one other piece with me. Yeah. And it, this is a newer piece? No. Oh, okay. This is where the other pieces you're looking at came mm. from. This was the origin of this body of work, which is, I, I do very abstract and color field work. I rarely do any, even though I use structure in my work, uh, to contrast that which is really fluid. I use a lot of space and some structure to contrast that and control it and to interrupt the space in it. And this is much more, um, th this was done for a show. I had to do a series for a show and just didn't quite know what to do. So I started making lines until it came to me. And that really changed how I'm working and continued after the show, after I produced all the work for the show and I began to, the show was called White on White. Mm -hmm. And I am not a white person. I, I am, I work black on black. You know that you've seen my black work, Emily. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm totally the opposite of this. So um, it was really challenging to create anything. So I sat down and said, I'm just going to start making lines till something comes to me. And that's where this whole series came oh. out of. And once the show was over, I'd been working on them for so long that I really was, you know, kind of lost my footing on what I was doing before. So I just thought I'll start infusing some color in and I'll start moving back toward uh, 
my roots, landscape, and back towards some of the colors that I lean toward in my other work. Hmm. Cool. Thanks, Sharon. And interesting about this series, I, I, I want to share because we're all, you know, we all pay attention uh, to what people say about the work, mm -hmm. but this white series is really uh, unusual for me in that I'm not real attached to it. So it's really interesting to hear the feedback I get on it um, because I, that feedback even though we all get used to taking feedback, positive and negative, and not necessarily taking everything to heart, the feedback I've gotten on, on these pieces, the white ones in particular, mm -hmm. um, it has been processed very differently in that um, I'm much Charlie. more objective about them. I'm really objective. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm hearing the feedback differently than I've ever mm -hmm. heard about my work. Hmm. And how does that really influence your, you know, you're thinking about the it, next pieces that you're. It, oh, what's wrong? Going. What's wrong? Um, it, it builds my trust in myself, actually. Uh -huh. I mean, I, I trust I've been working a long time and sometimes, you know, someone mentioned making mistakes in work. Mm -hmm. You know, in, in these particular pieces, I always make mistakes. I mean, I always make mistakes anyway, but digging out of a mistake in this work is a mm -hmm. lot of work. If I, you know, it'll go along really well. And then I'll put a color in that is like, that is absolutely wrong. And digging my way out um, because of the way that I'm working, because I'm layering, right, uh, is is really really difficult, and and I've really learned to um, what being more objective is is it really solidifies my ability to trust myself mm -hmm. that when I'm standing there going, oh God, I just wasted a week of my life, that somehow I will uh, figure it out and recover. Well, I think like the. Uh, I think Tiffany also mentioned like she didn't want to waste her paint. I think like, I think that's uh, like that sense of guilt sort of like, that's something you have to shed. Uh, I think in the studio, you can't, I think you, you can't worry about wasting time or paint because it all, it all goes into like yeah. the cumulative thing that you're trying to accomplish. But it's become a challenge, right? And it's become a challenge out of the fact that I know I can do it. And mm -hmm. then it becomes another game of mm -hmm. how do I do it now? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, the blue piece that you showed was, was a real big mistake. And it probably took me more time than any other piece I've ever done in my life to, <laughs> to come up with this. But um, right. it also signals a really positive direction for me. Mm -hmm. I mean, the satisfaction is great. The pain is great, but the satisfaction <laughs> is great. Uh, relatable. Thanks, Sharon. That's cool. Um, Eric, sorry this is taking so long. Uh, we we have a lot of artists to go through. I appreciate everyone hanging in there to listen. All right. Let's see. So. This is Eric's studio, and Eric shares a space with Kevin Swallow. You know, this picture was actually taken right after after a lockdown, mm -hmm. and we had had a show right before that. And I was taking work on, and I had a feeling that I, things were closing up, and I wasn't going to get back in there. It was like kind of like the last. I don't know. I just felt like something was 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 changing, right? And I was just. I don't know. Things are. I don't know. I my usually. I usually my walls are filled filled with mm -hmm. painting, and uh, here it's. I mean, it's empty. Yeah, it feels a little sad in here with the chair. So, uh, it looks like it's not loading one of the images I have for you. But this is another one that you sent me. That's kind of similar to to uh, what you have in the show. Yeah, so this kind of started off. Usually, you know, I've been painting. I've been in the building since um, was it two thousand and one, mm -hmm. 
and uh, I had my start painting at Little Street. I was getting an MFA at Columbia College in fiction writing, and I saw an ad in um, the reader for a painting class at Little Street. And it just felt like something I really wanted to do. And, um, you know, it's something that's just kind of stuck, right? So mm -hmm. usually my work, um, I started painting in oils. This is acrylic on canvas. And usually my work is all about just flow. I don't have a plan like this work. I just start by putting fields of color on. Mm -hmm. And then over time, um, things just speak to me and the, the space just gets filled up with stuff. So like Kevin, do you have multiple pieces that you're working on at a given time? You know, or? Historically I have, uh -huh. and in these bigger pieces, I mean, this is like 36 by 24. I've just been working on these by themselves. I, I, I don't work as much as I used to. Um, I own my own business and uh, I just been distracted with stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And art hasn't been my focus as the way it used to be. Mm -hmm. I still have a practice of drawing. I draw a lot um, in my house, in my basement studio here, or my chair upstairs. And um, so. And so did, had you had a studio prior to being at Cornelia Arts Building or? No, no, it was uh -huh. at Little Street. So they had uh -huh. open studios there actually. It was a, uh, one class was at Little Street. They had a class Thursday night and they had one, one night of open studios. So you paint, you know, Sunday afternoons mm -hmm. and um, Thursday nights. I used to get really mad, you know, my, on the phone, but I used to get really mad. My mom used to have family dinners on Saturday and Sunday nights, and I used to get really angry at her um, mm -hmm. because that was my time. And right. Was, <laughs> family, that was nice, right? Right. And so working alongside other artists as you kind of graduate from Little Street to having your own studio space, how has that influenced or changed your work, if at all? Yeah, I guess, you know, I'm for a long time, I was just kind of kept to myself, right? Mm -hmm. So when you shared space where you within the, within a building and you talk to other people, you know, you hear you hear people talk about your work, you hear um, opinions, uh, etc. Right? Where mostly, you know, if if, it was, if, if I if, if if I was left to up to my own devices, a lot of the times I would um, not really interact with people, right? In terms of because for me, work is really personal, right? It's mm -hmm. not just about talking about a dialogue with myself what's going on within me right right like the other piece that's in the show that's it's it was done in a, in a year's time a little bit over a year and as it's just about things that are going on in my life mm -hmm. and they just kind of like the scenes appear i mean even this one for example you know there's things that happened historically in my life right um there's that writing up at the top of the uh of, of the frame mm -hmm. It's just a, it's a recollection of, of something that happened in my, in my, when I was a teenager, right? Mm -hmm. Or there's, you know, I listen to music all the time when I paint, like most people, but a lyric hits me, right? And there's that lyric in the middle there, go with them, ring your bell. I mean, that's from a song too. It's just things are just um, happening mm -hmm. simultaneously, right? While I'm painting. I have another piece that you submitted this one's really interesting too this this has more of the narrative story written out on it but again like to me like your i your work reminds me a lot of like medieval painting in some ways the way the the narrative plays across the whole canvas you know so time is kind of broken up into these like moments that are experienced as a single piece. I thought about that. And you know, there's a painting, I don't know, he's a Flemish painter mm -hmm. in the Middle Ages, but there's the, in the middle of the screen, there's a man, he's getting his, um, his skin peeled off, right? Mm -hmm. But throughout the rest of the painting, there's little scenes of what he mm -hmm. had done to, to get him into that position where he got his skin peeled off. And right. things, you know, I, it was interesting. uh who am i missing anyone who is in the show here did i not call on anyone i think i got everybody so um if you guys have a little bit of time uh 
or fortitude for another 10 minutes, maybe like we can ask some questions of artists. Does anyone have any, uh, you can put it in the chat or you can just unmute yourself and ask the question or even of fellow artists. Nobody. <laughs> so I think the interesting thing overall for me is like, um, art is about communication. It's it's not like although it's an individual experience uh, and an internal exploration to create work. It's also about connecting to other people. Oh. Did, did you have a question, 847? Oh, this is, oh, this is Beth, Beth Cammy. Uh, yeah, oh, hi, Beth. Sorry, I was just traveling and stuck in COVID, so I'm like extra sitting in my studio right now. Uh, thank you. It's been very nice to hear everybody's input and what they're up to and what they're thinking. And, you know, Emily, um, you guys did a great job. Kevin, thank you so much. Um, you know, I've been in the building for, I don't know, maybe 15 years. And um, I, I think we lost our way a little bit, but hopefully we will be able to get back to where we were. And I do think a community is a really special bond. It's helpful to know you have someplace to go mm -hmm. for whatever the reasons are, uh, to produce, to escape, to w create whatever but uh, to go someplace that there are no boundaries and there are no attitudes. It's just a, you know, quality place to explore and uh, grow. So yeah, good building. Thanks, Beth. Um, and so the exhibit is up for one more week. You have one more week to see the show if, if you're in the Chicago area. Um, and our hours are Friday and Saturday noon to 5 p.m. But if you can't make those dates, I, you know, get in touch with me. We can schedule another time this week if you'd like to come by. Uh, and we're having a closing reception, right? Yes, and that's true. And the catalogs. Okay, Thank you. <laughs> yeah, so uh, <laughs> next Saturday, the 22nd, will be the closing reception. So a lot of the artists should be there on that day um it's just gonna be sort of a more general open house so noon to five um there may be some beverages and we also have a catalog for the exhibit which is in production uh you can purchase that on our website eatpaintstudio.com and i'm just checking the chat uh the catalog is almost ready it's i'm getting the proof i think it came while we're on this call actually. So um, it should ship out like in the next 10 to 15 days. So Emily, are they all drop shipping to people that order or are you gonna have them in the gallery? Um, I can't remember what you said. If you order from our website, I will um, ship them to you and I'll try to get them signed by all the artists for you. So that'll be my post show project. <laughs> and and otherwise there you can order them through um through blurb after the, the show comes down so thank you everybody so much for being here any any other thoughts or questions yeah um it was really interesting to listen to all my fellow artists um and how how they think about their work. I mean, even though we talk, I don't think we formally speak in this way. Like, mm -hmm. so it, it was really great to hear everyone. Yeah, absolutely. It was. Thank you so much for doing it. Um, and thanks for bearing with me with my weak Zoom skills and going over the time a little bit. Um, I hope you get to see the show and have a good night. And thanks for joining me and our artists. Thanks, Emily. Thanks, Emily. thanks everyone. Thanks. Beautiful Great show. To see you.